been able to be here? Long time, huh? Wow. We missed you guys. If you uh, would like, open your New Testaments to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. I hope you like that. We're going to talk tonight for a little bit about traditions. I brought this subject up, I don't know how many years ago, preached on it some, but I thought I'd come back to it because it just seems like in recent conversations I've had with other people outside the assembly, it's, it's come up about three times and it seems to serve a very healthy purpose and helpful purpose and practical purpose. We're going to talk tonight about three kinds of traditions that I know exist. Now there might be more than three kinds. You might come up with some other kinds, and if you do, please let me know. I'd like to know that they exist and maybe put them on the list, but I want to at least talk about these three. First, let me define the word tradition, and I was very interested to see that the dictionary includes a, a traditional definition of tradition. This is a Funk and Wagnall Standard De Desk Dictionary. And it says of tradition. Definition number one. The knowledge, doctrines, customs, practices, etc. transmitted from generation to generation. Also the transmission of such knowledge, doctrines, etc. In other words, it's things we know, things we teach, things we practice, customs we have that are ongoing. And so we, we do them and we pass them on to the next generation and, and they do them. We, we get the, uh, the adverb traditionally to express the way we do something on a regular basis. Traditionally, this is how we do it, which means regularly, this is how we do it. Whenever we do it, this is regularly, usually, most generally, how it's done, and we call that tradition. Another definition, this is definition number two. I thought this was interesting. It says, the body of unwritten Christian doctrine handed down through successive generations. Now think about that. Body of unwritten Christian doctrine. Isn't that somehow a misnomer? Isn't all Christian doctrine written in the book? That, that's what I'm thinking. I don't, maybe I missed something, but I'm thinking that's... However, there is a very good point to be made from this definition that's in the dictionary... And that is that there are so many things that have come up and been identified with Christianity that are not Christianity that even the dictionary, Mr. Funk and Mr. Wagnalls, decided it ought to be in the book as the unwritten, let me say it again from the book, the unwritten Christian doctrine, which is teaching, handed down through successive generations. All right. So there is a dictionary definition of traditions. I don't know about you, but of the last decade or so, <clears throat> I have been castigated. That's a fancy word that means people said bad things about me and reproached me and reproached the church in general for being too traditional. Now, there is a way in which we can be too traditional, but there is a way in which if we are not traditional enough, we have erred from the truth. And I, and I want to make that point from Scripture tonight. Uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, this is what Paul says, verse 1. It says, Be imitators of me, just as I also am of Christ. Now I praise you, because you remember me in everything, and hold firmly to the traditions, just as I delivered them to you. Why does Paul praise them? Well, he praises them, first of all, in this context, because they remember him and everything. But secondly, he praises them because they hold firmly to what? To the traditions. What traditions? 
traditions he delivered to them. By the way, whose apostle is he? He's the apostle of Jesus Christ, one of them. And as an apostle of Jesus Christ, he delivered traditions to the church at Corinth and to other churches as well. But in this letter he writes to the church at Corinth, he praises them for holding firmly to those traditions. Now the word in Greek, everybody loves it. Oh, a preacher's going to give us a Greek word. Woo! Are you impressed? The Greek word is paradosin. Paradosin. And I thought, I'm going to look that up and make sure I understand the meaning of the Greek word paradosin. I looked it up. Guess what it means? It means traditions. Sometimes there is a lot of insight to be gained from studying the etymology of a Greek word from which we get our, our English words, our translations. But I really like it when I go to the Greek and I find out that what the Greek word means is exactly what our English word means, and, and that's what this means. Now, I'm not saying there's not more insight to be gained, but I'm saying if you were to ask a Greek what the equivalent English word was to paradosin, he would say tradition if he spoke both languages. So, we're talking about traditions. But he's talking to the church at Corinth about traditions that he, as an apostle of Jesus Christ, gave to them. Now keep that in mind and go to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Same apostle, writing to a different congregation, church at Thessalonica. This is what he says in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 13. But we should always give thanks to God for you, brethren, beloved by the Lord, because God has chosen you from the beginning for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and faith in the truth. It was for this he called you through our gospel that you may gain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. So then, brethren, stand firm and hold to the traditions which you were taught, whether by word of mouth or by letter from us. What are they supposed to do with those traditions? They're supposed to hold, stand firm and hold on to those traditions. Whether we taught you by word of mouth or whether we sent a letter to you, we have given you traditions to practice, and that's what the New Testament records for us, and that's what they're supposed to hold to firmly. Chapter 3 of the same letter. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 6. Now we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you keep away from every brother who leads an unruly life and not according to the tradition which you received from us. Now, if anybody ever says to you, oh, the traditions aren't that big a deal, you need to take them to 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 and verse 6. Paul, the apostle of Jesus, issues a command. And how does he highlight or emphasize that command? He says, I'm commanding you in the name of Jesus Christ. I'm commanding you in the name of the only begotten Son of God, and this is what I'm commanding you. I want you to keep away from every brother who leads an unruly life and not according to the traditions. What Paul is saying is that tradi the traditions that God has given his people are means for fellowship and the departure from those traditions are means for withdrawing fellowship. Do you see that? It's pretty obvious, isn't it? Keep apart from every brother who leads an unruly life not according to these traditions. So we've got traditions and they are from God. We're supposed to hold firmly to them so firmly that if we've got a brother or sister in Christ who says, I don't want to keep those traditions anymore, our responsibility is to withdraw from them. That doesn't sound like much fun. But it's not about fun. It's about holding to the traditions as God has given them to us. Holding to the practices that he's delivered that are right, that are true, that are unchanging. Jesus said there is a way that is straight and narrow. What is it that makes that way straight and narrow? If it's not the traditions that God has given us. Well, what are some of these traditions? I've got a list here. 
of three kinds of tradition. First of all, there are the traditions that are from God. I think as I read through some of these, you'll recognize them and you can make your own list and add to this list things that you know are from God that are God's traditions, God's traditions, and we are not to depart from those whatsoever. The second list is what I call a list of facilitating traditions. Facilitating traditions. It'll be easier for me to talk about facilitating traditions after I give you some of God's traditions. And then the third list is a list of man's traditions. So, first tradition of God I want to talk about briefly to make a point is baptism. Is there any doubt as we read the New Testament that baptism is absolutely necessary for the remission of sin? I don't believe so. That's one of the things that makes us distinctive from most religious groups that call themselves Christian. We believe in baptism for the express purpose of God giving us forgiveness of our sin. That's what Peter preached on Pentecost in Acts 2.38. That's what Paul was told, the, the apostle that we've just been reading from, talking about these traditions. He was told, what are you waiting for? Arise and be baptized and you can finish it. Wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Now, that's the tradition of God. It doesn't change. We don't have any right to change it. But there are facilitating traditions. For example, traditionally, how do we baptize someone? We, we got a baptistry right here. What if we decided we're going to go to somebody's swimming pool and do a baptism? Is that all right? It's all right. What if we're going to go down to, uh, to the river? We got the North Canadian. And when, on a good cold day, the North Canadian actually feels warm. What if we baptize somebody in the North Canadian? That's water, isn't it? That's a baptism. Now, we don't traditionally do that because it's just so much handier to, to do it in a baptistry that's enclosed in a nice warm building with warmed and filtered water. So why I'm calling this a facilitating tradition is the baptistry facilitates the keeping of God's tradition without changing it or adding to it. So we do it traditionally. Now, if we decided that for whatever reason we need to do away with the baptistry? Any problem with that? No problem with that. It's, it's just God doesn't say you have to have a baptistry. Somebody wants to obey the gospel, we can find water. We'll get water somewhere. We don't have to have a baptistry. It's just a facilitating tradition. You know that Sunday night worship is a facilitating tradition? God says, I want you to meet on the first day of the week. That's not negotiable. We're supposed to meet on the first day of the week. So we, we meet and we, we might say of our Sunday morning service, that's our primary worship service. That's when everybody knows to come together. But we've decided somewhere back down the line, hey, it's a good idea to come on, Wednesday, on Sunday night too and have more encouragement, more fellowship, more prayers, more singing, more praise. Anything wrong with coming out on a Sunday night? No. But it is a facilitating tradition. It helps us to do some things that God likes for us to do. But we don't have to do it. Now, please don't ever think I'm ever in favor of doing away with Sunday night. I think there's little enough spiritual influence in the world now. I don't I sure don't want to do it away with a Sunday night worship assembly. Wednesday night's the same. The scriptures don't say you must assemble on Wednesday night. But God has some traditions of fellowship in Bible study, just like in Acts chapter 2 and verse 42, said so there were four things that the, the saints continued in. The Lord's Supper was one of those, it says breaking of bread, but I think it means the Lord's Supper, and I think they did it on the first day of the week because that was traditionally uh, the way they did it according to Acts chapter 20 and verse 7. But there was also fellowship and the apostles' teaching and prayer. And those are three traditions of God that we can keep on Wednesday night if we come together. So it's, it's a good idea. Anybody going to hell if they don't come on Wednesday night? I think that's the wrong question. There's, there's a funny joke that goes with that too. On judgment day, all the people are lined up at the great throne and God's passing judgment. And as the judgment begins, there's a great cheer of, of relief that starts at the front and comes towards the back. And people in the back are saying, what's going on up there? What's going on? And somebody hollers back, Sunday nights and Wednesday nights don't count. Now, that's just a funny joke about a legalistic approach to Sunday nights and Wednesday nights. But I want to tell you something about Sunday nights and Wednesday nights. 
Jesus said, Blessed are you if you hunger and thirst for righteousness. Who do you think comes out on Sunday nights and Wednesday nights? Except people who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Now, I'm not trying to give you some kind of false praise. I'm telling you that you see the value in being here. You see the value in the fellowship. You see the value in the presence. You see the value in the assembly. Even if we may not have a, quote, a legal obligation to be here, you see the value in it, and so you come. Marvelous. Wonderful. I think it, it helps in every way. I've never come out to a Sunday night or a Wednesday night assembly and said, well, I wish I didn't go. Never done that. And I've been doing it for a long time. And I'd never have talked to anybody who's had to say that. Some more uh, traditions of God and facilitating traditions. Marriage is a tradition of God. We don't have the right to say, well, we're going to do away with marriage. We're just going to start living together. Where would everybody ever get such a crazy idea as that? I don't know. People do it all the time, don't they? And they're straying from God's tradition. Now, marriage is a tradition of God, but how about a marriage ceremony? I found it interesting that you, you really don't see any marriage ceremonies in Scripture. God doesn't say, here's the way to do a marriage ceremony, and here's the marriage ceremony that makes the marriage legitimate. You don't find that in Scripture. And so it's left up to us, how do you want to have a marriage ceremony? I, I think people ought to go to the justice of the peace, personally. Because a wedding ceremony is a lot of work. And it's a lot of money. And it's the marriage, not the wedding, that makes all the difference. At any rate, what's our tradition? Well, we spend about $50,000 and everybody dresses up in a rented tux. And, and we eat little hot dogs basted in barbecue sauce and blow out candles and take two different kinds of sand and pour them together, and then everybody goes home tired. That's kind of our tradition, isn't it? Is that okay? Well, yeah, that's okay. It's, it's a facilitating tradition, but the tradition of God is a marriage. Two people love each other. They want to spend their lives with each other. They want to have a family. Get married. That's God's tradition. Otherwise, it's fornication. That's not what anybody wants. Well, it's not what God wants. Singing is worship. I wanted to address this one in particular for a, for a couple of reasons. Uh, everybody these days has some kind of an electronic device with music on it. How many of you, I'm just curious, uh, this isn't a criticism, I wouldn't criticize anybody for it. I listen to the radio all the time in, in my car. How many of you have some kind of a personal listening device with music on it? I'm just curious. Anybody willing to volunteer? Okay. A lot of hands going up. That's fine. Who do you want to program your personal listening device? Somebody else or you? The music is a very personal thing, and I believe it's a very personal thing with God. He hadn't said that, but he has given us a tradition. What's God's tradition for music? Singing. Singing. Making melody where? In the heart. Now, we know if we're supposed to sing, we, we make whatever melody we can with our mouth and our vocal cords but he really wants the melody to be in our heart. What kind of songs? Psalms, hymns, spiritual songs. There's a lot of songs that I like, and they're good songs, but they don't fit into any one of those three categories. I, I really like Country Roads Take Me Home. John Denver did it. It's about West Virginia. I love that song. It speaks to me of my, my home state. But it's not a psalm, it's not a hymn, it's not a spiritual song, per se. And so we don't use it to offer up to worship. We know the difference. And so we stick with God's tradition. Now one thing we do use, as we discussed a little bit in an elders meeting, we've got, uh, we got a highfalutin projector, that's what it is. Kept wanting to say camera. We've got a projector, and we've got some software back there, and a computer, and we can project the words and the music to songs on a screen back here. Is that okay? That's okay. That's what you call, or what I call, a facilitating tradition. It doesn't change the fact that we are still singing. It doesn't change or add to the fact that we are singing from the heart, and it doesn't change or add to the fact that we're singing psalms, hymns, 
spiritual songs. It is something that, that facilitates, just like a songbook does, or just like a sound system does, for the song leader to be able to announce the number and to sing so that everybody can hear the, the tune, those kinds of things. A pitch pipe is a facilitating piece of equipment to help him get on pitch. Now, if he starts blowing that pitch pipe, by the way, that would be something else, to see somebody play a song with a pitch pipe. <laughs> but if he played that pitch pipe, then that would change it. That's no longer singing and making melody on the heart. That's playing, making melody on an instrument. And there's a difference. There's a difference. One is God's tradition. Another is man's tradition. But using the pitch pipe to get a pitch, using the songbook to sing the song, using the screen, all that simply facilitates what God has said he wants us to do. And so we've got God's tradition and a necessary facilitating tradition to go with it. Because if we're going to sing, we've got to figure out how we're going to do it. Are we going to have one man get up in front and lead us? That is traditionally how we do it. Sometimes I've been in devotional meetings, that's small church meetings, we call them devotionals because it's just not traditional church. But what we do in those sometimes is we just announce, now if there's any man here who wants to lead a song, just lead it from your seat. And we're all sitting there, and one of the brothers will start leading a song, and we'll sing it. And when that song is done, maybe another brother will start leading a song, and we'll sing it. Anything wrong with that? I don't think so. I think it's great. We're singing. We're making melody in our heart. We're singing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. We're not changing anything. We're not adding anything to it. It's just a facilitating way of doing what God says. Communion. The Lord's Supper. Do we have any choice as to whether or not we should practice that as Christians? Well, no. That's a tradition of God. We need to keep that. How are we going to do it? How would you like to have a one-cup service next week? No, I'm not asking whether or not it's doctrinal or undoctrinal or spiritual or unspiritual. Does having one cup change anything about having the Lord's Supper? Well, it might take a little longer, but it would be perfectly legitimate to do that. I don't want to do it. I really like the idea of having multiple plastic cups to know that as soon as we're done, those things are going to be thrown away, and next week I'm going to get a fresh cup. I like that because I'm an American, and that's the way we do things in America. <laughs> but we need to keep in mind we're Christians. We're members of the kingdom of God, and we need to do things the right way in the kingdom. What if we go to Africa? What if we go to some place like Haiti and they may not have multiple plastic communion cups? What if their way, way or means of doing the Lord's Supper is different from ours and we find out I might have to drink after some of my brothers and sisters? Is that unscriptural? It's not unscriptural. Is it wrong or immoral? No. However we do it, it needs to facilitate what God wanted done. And what he wanted done was for us to drink the fruit of the vine and remember the blood that his son shed for us. He wants us to eat unleavened bread and remember the body that his son gave for us. And there are different ways we can do it. In the military, we have these little kits that we'll send off to soldiers. And in that kit will be a piece of bread and a, and a, and a little uh, container with some grape juice in it. And... I, I know what happens sometimes. You get a group of Christians together and everybody gets their own little package of communion stuff and everybody gets out their cracker. Somebody leads a prayer, makes some comments about remembering the body of Jesus and everybody eats that cracker. Then they get out their grape juice and everybody pours their grape juice in the cup that's provided. Somebody makes some comments, somebody says a prayer and they all drink their grape juice together. That's not how we do it, is it? Is it wrong? Well, of course not. They're keeping the Lord's tradition. The facilitating tradition is a little different from ours, but they're keeping the Lord's tradition. And we need to remember the difference between those two things, God's traditions and facilitating traditions. God's traditions we always keep. God's traditions we always honor. Facilitating traditions, no, we can, we can change it if we want to. 
as long as there's no hidden agenda or evil purpose behind the change, change can be good. What if next week the song leader says, let's not use our screen today, let's not use our song books, we're going to sing the first line of about eight or ten hymns, and I'll just start leading them, and you sing from memory. What would that be like? I, I think it might be a really interesting spiritual experience. And I, I know it sounds funny, but I think you'd be surprised how many first lines of hymns you know by heart without even thinking about it consciously. Well, I talked about some traditions, and there are probably some others I'd, I'd like to talk about, but time's going to get gone here. But there's a third kind of tradition that we haven't talked about much, and those are traditions of men. These are traditions that God did not give us, and these are traditions <clears throat> that are not designed to facilitate God's traditions even. These are traditions that are, are of human origin and have nothing to do with God or His church. How about the clergy laity system? I'm clergy, you're laity. Uh, nah, 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 nah. What do you think of me now? Oh, now there's a separation. Now there's a difference. See, previous to that thought, we're all just brothers and sisters in Christ. I just happen to be the one who is standing up to speak. But I'm not any different from you. I'm not clergy. You're not laity. We are all priests, according to the Holy Spirit as he speaks through Peter. With that, what about vestments? Vestments, you know what vestments are? That's the neat clothes that you get to wear when you're a member of the clergy. Can't wear them if you're not a member of the clergy. But if you're a member of the clergy, you can wear your vestments. Not long after I started preaching, I was asked to do a, a wedding. And the bride asked, what vestments will you wear? And I said, vestments? I don't have any vestments. She said, well, my preacher, my pastor's got vestments, and you can use his, his vestments. And I said, would it be okay if I just rented a tux? And she said, well, I guess that'd be fine. So, all right, I had a tux. It was long and purple, went to the floor, had a big white, <laughs> no, no. But, but you see what I'm talking about? Did Jesus wear vestments? Did any of the apostles wear vestments? All that stuff is of human origin. It has nothing to do with the church or, or the way the Lord seemed to want things to go because he didn't, he didn't include it as part of all truth that was given to the apostles by the Holy Spirit. What about fundraisers? I'm not saying there's any necessary inherent evil in saying we're going to have a church-wide uh, garage sale and raise money for this or for that. But when we look into the New Testament, we find that the money that was raised there was all by free will offerings. What about christening babies? Little babies born. And we have a tradition when a baby's born. We bring it up here and we introduce it to the congregation, give its name, introduce the parents, and we pray over that little one. Anything wrong with that? Praying for a little baby that comes into our, our midst, I think that's a fantastic idea. Now, what if we said, we're going to dip it down into baptistry, and it's going to change its spiritual relationship with the Lord. It's going to change something, but it's not going to be a spiritual relationship with the Lord. See that? And I'm not trying to make fun of anybody. I'm just saying there are some things that are of God that we are supposed to stick with, and there are other things that are for men, and they might appear to be spiritual, they might appear to be profound, but, but if they're not of God, we shouldn't be doing them. Sprinkling or pouring for baptism. Baptism, Greek word, means burial, immerse. You, you put them under. Jesus died and was buried. And he rose from that burial on the third day. And that's what we, we reenact according to Romans chapter 6. We die to sin. We're buried with Christ in baptism, buried into death, and rise to walk in what kind of life? New life. Without that resurrection, there is no new life. There's a little bitty, some of you might have seen it, there's a little bitty deer got hit and it's laying by the road up here on Choctaw Road. Now, 
probably in the next day or two, somebody who works for the city is going to come by and pick that thing up and take it somewhere and bury it. Now, if they picked it up and took it somewhere and laid it out and took a shovel full of dirt and spread on it, said, okay, it's buried, what would somebody say? It's not buried. Pour some dirt on it. It's not buried. You've got to put that little thing under the ground, and that's what happens in a baptism. How about a, a prayer of faith asking Jesus to come into your heart? Now, that sounds really spiritual, doesn't it? The problem is you can't find it taught in the Scriptures. When thousands of people responded to Peter's preaching on Pentecost and said, Men and brethren, what shall we do? We've killed the Son of God. Peter did not say, Ask the Lord Jesus to come into your heart. Say a prayer and ask Him to come into your heart. Bow your head while I'm praying and raise your hand. And if you raise your hand while I'm praying, you'll be saved. Anybody ever been to a service where that's what people were told to do? I've been there. Happens all the time. Departures from the faith. How about a pastor system with one man at the helm? How many denominational churches do you know where one man's in charge? In the New Testament, there were pastors, but pastors are elders, overseers, bishops, shepherds, all different words for the same office, and there was always a plurality. To depart from that tradition, well, it puts us on shaky ground. I'll go ahead and bring this lesson to a conclusion, but the point I want to make is we're supposed to be traditional people. There are supposed to be some things that we keep, and we keep them from generation to generation to generation to generation. This is why the Apostle Paul told Timothy, the things which you have learned, what's he supposed to do with them? Teach other faithful men that they may teach other faithful men, that they may teach other faithful men. You see where this is going? By nature, it's traditional. According to Deuteronomy 6, what are parents supposed to do with the Word of God and their children? You teach your children the Word of God. You keep it going. You instill this in their hearts and in their minds. It's supposed to be traditional, but they're supposed to be the traditions of God, not the traditions of men. And when we look at God's traditions and decide we're going to come up with a way to facilitate this tradition, we need to be careful about making our facilitating traditions equal with God's traditions. Why do we have a church building? Because God said to meet. I want you to meet. Isn't it nice to have a church building? Nice to have lights and heat, all the things that come with a church building. But if we didn't have one, would we still be the church? Sure we would. Sure we would. I'm thinking about our brothers and sisters in Christ in the Philippines right now. I wonder what their assemblies have been like today if they've been able to have one at all. And next week and the week after that, dealing with what they have to deal with. We've got it good in a lot of ways. One of the reasons I think we've got it good is because when our founding fathers started this country, they recognized the concept of God's traditions and man's traditions, and they set out to establish a nation that was based on God's traditions. I don't think they got it perfect, but I think this has been a great nation because of the influence Leaders in this country have allowed God to have. And I want to see that continue. And if it doesn't continue in the nation, I at least want to see it continue in this congregation. Amen? Following the Lord's traditions. That's what we need to be about. Well, of course, as we mentioned, one of those traditions is baptism for the remission of sins. If you're outside of Christ at this moment, you don't have to stay that way. You can confess the name of Jesus Christ, repenting of your sin, and, and we'll bury you in this water. Or if you want, we'll take you down to the North Canadian. We'll go tonight. I got a flashlight. And it's November. There won't be too many snakes out. It'll be a good time to do it. Serious as a heart attack. If you need the prayers of this congregation, what a wonderful tradition to keep when we confess our sins to one another and pray for each other that we might be healed. Either way, we're going to stand and sing a song of encouragement. And if you need to respond, just come on down and let us know how we can help.